The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you everyone for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by 4Med Approved and 4MedTraining.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Training and Education with 4Med Training, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch will cover what's new in mobile technology for healthcare providers. We are joined today by representatives of two companies that are at the forefront of mobile HIT. We'll begin with Kimberly Warner of Body Media Inc. Kim is Body Media's Director of Professional Sales, and she's going to tell us about trends in mobile health and the potential of wearable devices. She's going to tag team with Steve Smeeds, who is the API Evangelist at Body Media. In the second part of our presentation, we'll speak with Donald Bauman, CEO of Isabel Healthcare. Don is going to inform us about clinical decision support on mobile devices. Before we begin, some quick notes for our attendees. If you have questions during this session, please enter them into the chat area during the presentation. In the second half of our presentation, we will address as many questions as time allows. If we do run out of time, answers to all submitted questions will be posted to our website and sent by email link later in the week. Also, Note that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email with links to both the recorded and PDF versions of the event. We've got a lot of ground to cover today, but I know this will be a very informative session. So let's start with Kimberly. What are the market trends in mobile health? Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, I wanted to just share <clears throat> with the group that um, there's a couple of trends in, in the market. Um, and I wanted to address uh, foremost um, <clears throat> this chart here, which you see, which um, is talking about sports and fitness, home monitoring, and remote patient management. You're going to see that the wearable wireless sensor market uh, is growing currently and is projecting to grow in the future. But uh, I wanted everyone to note specifically um, the yellow bars, which actually represent remote patient monitoring. So as everyone is very probably very well aware on the phone, um, this is a growing market. Well, let's, uh, what can you tell us about the trends of Internet use and cell phone use? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, part of what's driving this trend is, is uh, the technology and the users uh, in the industry. So, um, as we all know, that uh, there are many of us using the Internet and cell phone these days, but not only are we using the Internet and cell phone, um, we're using these for um, looking up for health information online. We're also using our cell phones to look up medical information. So these, these two trends um, in the consumer arena are also driving towards um, medical care for these folks. What, what you can also um, tell is our, those, those who are self-tracking out there, um, you know, you can see from these statistics that 27% of the users um, track their own health data online. And you can see that 15% have actually tracked their weight, diet, or exercise online, where 17 have tracked some, some sort of health indicator or symptom, symptom online. So what you're seeing with this is that people are embracing technology more easily, plus it's uh, much more available to them. So what are some types of mobile health monitoring? So um, I put up here, you know, there's mobile health monitoring. I, I put up there pen and paper as well. I know that's not mobile. I just kind of wanted to put things into perspective. But we have all sorts of different ways of, of tracking. You know, pen and paper has been the, has been the way in the past uh, where in the, in the current years now we're using, we're using much more mobile technology. So we have mobile apps. You have pedometers, heart rate monitors, accelerometers, sleep monitors, and then um, devices where uh, body media falls into, which is a multi-sensor monitor. So um, as, as providers and uh, caregivers, you might start to see uh, patients and clients using all sorts of these devices. Well, what are some of the features and benefits of the technology? Yeah, so, um, you know, compared to paper and pencil, which is um, completely subjective, the, the data from these, um, th from these devices is very objective, right? So, um, you can really actually base your uh, behavior change on facts, facts about your body. Um, the information is personalized. Um, a lot of these uh, devices have sophisticated algorithms which are geared toward personalizing to your personalized data. They get to learn and know about you and tell you information about you. Um, 
these devices nowadays are, are pretty expensive, so it's a low-cost means to, to, um, to learn information about yourself as well as share that information with your healthcare professional. And, um, you know, they are highly accessible. I was talking in the first couple of slides about people are just embracing technology. I mean, I think if we, we all said to each other six years ago that, uh, hey, there's going to be a movement where a bunch of people are going to be wearing gadgets on their body and, and uh, measuring all sorts of uh, information about themselves, we might scratch our heads a little bit. But, you know, here it is. People are, are uh, embracing the idea of uh, using devices to track their um, any sort of uh, body and, and data information. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's a fun aspect to it. So uh, people aren't strictly just using these devices just for the data. Um, there is motivational pieces in this. There's uh, companies like ourselves are, are trying to make this fun. There's, there's lots of applications who are partnering with device companies like ours um, to make fun and innovative um, applications for, for users to be engaged and motivated. So what about benefits uh, for the patient from this technology? Yeah, so the patient, um, you know, like I said, it, there's, this is personalized feedback. Like I said, a lot of these devices, um, you know, if you hadn't had a, haven't had a chance, um, there's lots of devices out there that you can, can look at in this market. But um, they're getting really a lot better at uh, personalizing the feedback towards you. Um, some devices are just going to estimate some of your information, but there are devices out there like the body media device that actually is sensing your information, taking your physiological data, um, and personalizing that to, uh, to you. So um, also the devices today, um, some of them have applications that allow your provider to engage with you, so to kind of do remote treatment um, uh, with the patients. And like I mentioned in the previous slide, there's, there's increased motivation. Um, there's there's um, the gaming aspect of it. There's fun. There's challenges. But there's also the motivation behind you know, maybe being at a stuck place and, and knowing now information about yourself that you didn't previously know, being able to get over that hurdle. Um, and small successes are very motivating for people. Uh, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the data is objective. Um, patients have access to information that they usually would normally not have access to about themselves. Um, and this is on a 24-hour-a-day basis. Um, all this information provides teachable moments, and we know that teachable moments um, can drive right, right towards behavior change. Um, and then one other thing about uh, the technology, you know, accuracy does matter. Like I said, there's a, a, a plethora of devices out there, and they, they range the gamut. So um, depending on uh, the patient's needs, the physician's needs, um, they'll want to take a look at um, how accurate the device is for what they're trying to measure. So what do these devices mean for providers, then? There's a lot of the same benefits for providers as well as um, patients. For the providers, like I mentioned, um, you can now um, engage in remote monitoring. Um, you know, we did a study uh, with, with our products where um, we put our device versus a, um, a uh, remote uh, phone coaching uh, session. And using our device uh, along with, instead of the remote phone coaching actually uh, produced equal to, if not better, results in, uh, in weight loss and wellness. So what that tells us is that, um, you know, these devices uh, all across the board can really help in remote care, and it's an inexpensive way. Uh, phone coaching is a very expensive uh, means of, of uh, care. So um, devices these days can be an inexpensive way um, to, to care for your patients in a remote manner. Um, again, objective data. The, the providers do not need to rely on uh, the patient's best memory. Um, so really they can kind of, let's look at the facts, right? If they're talking with their patients, let's look at the facts. Let's see what's happening and, and uh, go from there and, and uh, base, base goals and uh, goals for behavior change on the objective data. Um, this will, for the providers, will lead to better outcomes in most cases. Um, the, the patient engagement um, we see is very high with devices. Again, the patient has access to information they would not normally know about themselves. And so does the provider. So together they can kind of tackle these um, plateau periods or, or um, hurdles that a, a patient and physician might um, incur together. Um, they're going to be able to uh, attack it head on uh, with objective data. And again, um, you know, teachable moments. Teachable moments and behavior change uh, go hand in hand. So the caregivers have, have something to go on with these patients. They have, they have a teachable moment. They have objective data. Um, so there's no, it takes the, the guesswork out of um, the, the scenario for, for weight loss and wellness. Um, and then again, uh, 
accuracy. Uh, accuracy needs to be considered for, for any device um, that you're looking to use. What does the future hold for mobile devices? Wow. So, I mean, when I, when I showed you that first slide, um, you know, that just that compounded growth is amazing. And, and um, you know, we are going to continue to see amazing growth. Um, the, the adaptation, I mean, the, these products and devices are being used in not only, um, you know, weight loss and wellness right now, but they're starting to, you're starting to see them in, in diabetes, in, in uh, cardiac, uh, in, um, in uh, physical rehab, all sorts of areas. Um, you know, the wearability is, is becoming a, a nicer feature as well. Devices, uh, device companies like ours are, are making strides every day in making these devices more comfortable to wear as well as more attractive. So, um, you know, in the industry, it won't seem like such a medical device that you're wearing. Um, it also speaks to, you know, this kind of, this care anywhere. Um, we're, we're all kind of moving to that, right? We're, we're trying to care for the patient in many hours of the day, not just the, uh, the time when the, the patient is in the doctor's office. Um, and, you know, these devices aren't just devices, right? They are actually devices that are holding data. And the fact that the data is portable and mobile is really um, the key piece of information here. Um, as far as health insurance reimbursements, you don't see health insurance reimbursement right now, today, for these devices. Most of these devices are purchased over the counter. Um, you can purchase them in retail stores. You can purchase them online. Um, many uh, medical and weight management centers do sell these devices for, for weight management programs. But as of today, you do not see health insurance reimbursement. What we do see is little, little by little trickling in. Um, some of these FSAs um, are starting to, to, um, to cover uh, payment for, for products and devices like this. But we do think it will be something that we see covered in the future. Um, you you know, and costs think, are coming down. I was just going to say, you have to think as things you know, move in an ACO direction to some extent that it just makes sense that they would have an interest in this sort of uh, technology. Absolutely, and it's just you know it's just a matter of time now. Um, and and part of that, what's helping is the costs are coming down, right? So it's it's these devices are much more affordable. Two three years ago, where there were five hundred dollars for these devices, you know, many of them that many of them are around a hundred dollar price point, uh, very affordable. Um, like I had mentioned, there are level different levels of accuracy, but it depends on what device you're looking for and what you're trying to measure. Whether it's you know just steps or motion, or if you truly want you know sleep, activity, um, you know, energy expenditure, all those things, um, you'll need to take a look at uh, accuracy around which device you're, you're looking for. Um, you're going to see more and more programs in corporate, and when I say programs, medical programs as well as corporate wellness programs, incorporating devices into um, their business plans. It's just going to be a way of the future. They're going to do it for many reasons. Number one, for, for outcomes, engagement, objective data but as well as um, when you talk about, you know, corporate wellness um, incentives and getting these um, premiums down. And then, uh, of course, today, which I think we're going to talk a little bit more about, but electronic uh, medical records. We're going to see our products um, integrated into these EHRs more and more. You're going to have patient-facing and physician-facing portals in these EHRs, and all of this data and information is going to be shared back and forth between uh, patients and professionals uh, in a seamless manner. Um, and one of the last trends I just wanted to mention is uh, a consumable technology. Right now, we see device hardware out there. We see uh, devices that people wear, carry in their pocket, wear around their neck, something like that. Ours you actually wear on your arm. Um, but um, we'll probably be the first ones to the market with a, um, well, we have been, with a consumable technology. So imagine all the same things that devices do now, but in a disposable patch format. So something that you wear for five to seven days is an evaluation and then toss it in the garbage when you're finished. So I think this may be where we're going to bring in Steve. Um, this is a question about API, but how, how, did this, how does technology allow these devices to talk to each other, basically? Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so really what you're building with the API is, uh, you know, what they refer to as a platform. Uh, and the platform is built up of many different components. Uh, and we talk about APIs, which stands for uh, Application Programming Interface. What that really means is the common language, all these different components of the platform use to talk to each other. Uh, and this slide just kind of shows one example of a possible platform. Uh, on the left side, you see many different devices, different manufacturers, 
different kinds of data, and they're all feeding that data using APIs into uh, what we call basically the engine. And the engine is made up of uh, basically the sensors that are taking you know these readings, uh, what we call new vital signs. So you know we're used to old vital signs in the hospital, but all these devices are feeding. 24-7 uh, new data about their patients that we kind of almost consider new vital signs. Uh, how are they moving? How are they sleeping? Uh, what is their activity level like? Uh, and of course, with those engines, you get the lifestyle context for the individual patients and analytics against that, as well as large free living databases, which really take all the different patients' data and can be used for larger research projects. Uh, gleaming more information about uh, you know an entire population of people rather than just one or two patients uh, and all that's coming from the individual data coming out of these devices uh, and once again uh, that common language that is used to accomplish this is really APIs you have both device APIs and application APIs but this is basically how all this data is uh, talked back and forth and how it's understood by all these various components using a common standard. Uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Got a little noise on the line there. Sure. Uh, and then finally, uh, also using APIs, you can take advantage of all this information on the platform across a variety of different industries and areas of interest. Uh, of course, electronic health records being one, but uh, uh, obesity management, uh, sleep and fitness control. And then as well as uh, chronic health issues, uh, diabetes, cardiac, elderly care. Uh, we can even do kind of remote management, making sure people aren't falling down, uh, which is also interested in other industries such as uh, safety, transportation, you know, make sure a police officer is moving correctly, he hasn't fallen down, isn't getting up. Uh, so this kind of just shows how APIs can be used to drive uh, these entire platforms of, of data across industries. So why integrate these devices? Sure. Uh, well, the situation right now is we have you know hundreds and thousands of different devices all talking in different ways to different systems, and none of it is really glued together very well. Uh, and they're talking about basically going into the future, we're going to have at least 100 times more data about each and every patient than we do today. And as I mentioned, you're going to be monitoring different vital signs, not just the lab tests they get when they come into the hospital, but really what they're doing every minute of every day uh, and how that's affecting their health. Uh, we'd be able, we need to be able to also compare that data among millions of patients to really glean the interesting uh, outcomes and research uh, that you can do. And none of that's possible without integration. Uh, so again, today everything is separate and distinct and there's not very much overlap and there's not very good global standards. Uh, there are uh, major companies that are working towards this and starting to build these platforms, but again, they all need to talk to one another. Uh, so we think going in the future, the next big effort is to merge all of this into one single system. Uh, and that will make this mass high quality computerization possible and this huge integration across a, a variety of industries and manufacturers possible. Uh, and again, the, uh, the way this is done, APIs are the common language that will kind of drive this. Uh, and, and we really hope uh, for this industry, you know, electronic health records are going to become the libraries where all these results will be stored. So now we're going to pivot and talk to uh, Mr. Bauman of Isabel. Um, before we begin, I just want to say to our uh, attendees that if you have questions, please go ahead and enter them into the chat area, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So uh, Don, what types of clinical decision support do you find being used in mobile devices today? Right, there's a, a whole host of, uh, of different kinds of tools being used by clinicians. Uh, ranging from uh, you know, helping with decisions at the very beginning of a clinical journey, like clinical decision support for diagnostics. There are symptom checkers being used uh, by patients and consumers. Um, and there's also a whole suite of referential access uh, to disease monographs, drug reference tools, um, and all kind of helping drive uh, efficient decisions and providing access to uh, providers and, and consumers with 24 by 7 content. Who are the primary users of mobile CDS technology today? So we're seeing, uh, uh, as, as Kimberly pointed out, there's an explosion in, uh, in uh, everybody using uh, mobile devices uh, and accessing healthcare information. Um, but the primary folks that are using things uh, from a CDS perspective are you know, physician assistants, uh, nurse practitioners, practicing physicians, um, you know, nursing is, is getting into it, 
uh, pharmacy uh, folks are starting to use it, and, and you know, one big uh, area of, uh, of users is certainly consumers. Um, and we're seeing it being used in a number of different ways as well with these types of groups. So what's your view on mobile technology for assisting clinicians with decision making? I think they're, uh, they're challenged today because of many of the, the, the statistics, you know, the explosion in access to data and data collection um, through remote monitoring uh, uh, and, and some of the things that Kimberly mentioned, um, but also the, you know, the Internet and, and consumers going to the Internet for, uh, for health care information. I think data explosion um, is, is put you know, a lot more pressure on providers to react and act uh, you know, almost in a 24 by 7 immediate access mode. And, and I think what the, the benefit of these tools is, is actually giving providers access anywhere, anytime um, when they need it. Um, you know, and it you know, helps them respond and make sense of, of uh, the data that's coming in um, you know, on a 24 by 7 basis. What modes of mobile access have been embraced for CDS tools? So what's popular now? And so you know, obviously the, the native uh, iDevice uh, apps are, are pretty prevalent, and, and most of the providers of CDS tools are, are providing those types of, uh, of, of access. So native iPhone, iPad, uh, uh, iPad Mini, um, folks are developing on uh, native Android apps um, to kind of deal with the multiple types of phones that are out there today. Uh, and mobile devices that are out there today, people are looking at HTML5 in a more, which allows the developers of these tools to develop in a more uh, kind of generic way and fit on mobile platforms. Uh, Windows Mobile is a, is a popular uh, platform as well. Um, it's really you know, on mostly uh, on non-proprietary tech devices, so it, it is really a, a broad-reaching and uh, uh, accessible just about to any kind of phone or mobile device available. So when you say non-proprietary devices, do you mean that the software is distinct from the hardware, it's not an all-in-one, or what do you mean by that? Yeah, exactly. So uh, you know, the software is available on just about any kind of uh, you know, non-proprietary device. Um, you know, some of the uh, highly proprietary operating systems on mobile devices aren't, aren't being as embraced as, as, uh, as most uh, of the yeah, kind of more generalized devices, so um, it is uh, it is making it uh, just kind of accessible to everybody. So, what problems can mobile CDS solve for clinicians? Um, there is, uh, I mentioned, I think one of the, the key things that uh, that it, it helps with uh, for clinicians is uh, access to data. Um, you know. Patients are, are going to the internet. Uh, you know, if, if we take just one example of uh, of uh, uh, some information that came out of the Pew Research Survey in 2012, um, they were they did a big survey. 35% of the respondents look for a diagnosis information online. So people are going to the internet and accessing data. 53% of those interactions resulted in connecting with a provider. Um, in, in not surprising, 70%, 77% of those uh, surveys started with a non-specific engine. So they're accessing information online, showing up with their, at their provider's office and, and or in the hospital with you know, data that they printed off online perhaps. Um, it may not be the most reliable sources. Um, that puts you know, a lot of you know, undue burden and stress on, on clinicians. So, Providing access to, to CDS tools on mobile devices allows them to react to that kind of demand. Um, it really helps improve and make efficient decisions. Um, so by uh, providing the data that they need to make the decisions about diagnosis, treatment, management, and, and, and follow-up, um, they can make those efficiently uh, while, uh, while using mobile CDS. Um, that leads to better outcomes and, and patient care and leads to improved satisfaction all the way around, and probably uh, you know, equally as important is it leads to uh, lower cost of care. How can mobile technology impact patient engagement then? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, 
um, patients, as we've talked uh, throughout, uh, patients are becoming wildly engaged in their in their care, and and quite frankly, they they, they need to be if we're going to achieve some of the the, the uh, cost savings that we want to achieve in healthcare, um, and so it can help provide meaningful information to consumers uh, as opposed to going into a wiki or a Google and there are tools that uh, that can help provide meaningful information uh, from a trusted source um, but these tools then can be embedded into programs that you know practices and or organizations can implement that can help drive in network uh, doctor finders so if you're an ACL or you're participating in a patient medical home um, you want to have and data on those patients throughout um, their entire you know, length of care, and if you can keep them in your network, um, that's better for everybody. So it can help drive in-network in physician finders. It can help drive content that you want your patient or consumer population to see. So you may have programs that are available for smoking cessation or those types of things that you want to push out. The data collected from, from um, uh, you know, symptom checkers, for example, can help drive pushing that content, kind of specified content, out to your consumer world. And symptom checkers have been identified as one of the key components to uh, to any engagement strategy. Um, and uh, you know, having those available, you know, again, with a trusted source, it keeps people off of uh, you know Google, and it provides them access to content that you want them to see as a as a healthcare system. Well, I really have to thank our panelists because we moved through a lot of material very quickly and we've got a lot of time for questions. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from our attendees so far, um, so I would encourage everyone else to ask questions as well. I know I have questions myself, so if you don't ask questions, I, I'm, I'm going to ask plenty myself. So let's get into our panel discussion a little bit. Um, here's a kind of a detailed question that I'll ask, and I'll just open it up to the floor of whoever thinks that they might want to handle this one. Are there any standards for storing the data that is collected? Is the HL7 data exchange format applicable at all? And then are there any standards bodies working to standardize the storage and transmission of the data that is collected by these devices? I, I wonder if, Don, that might be a good one for you, or is that a better one for Steve? I'm not, this is Steve, I, I'm not sure I have the answer to that one. I think, I, I'm not sure there is a, a standard for storage. I think part of it becomes a question of uh, how well those tools and, and mobile apps then become integrated with the EMR. Um, and I think that will help drive some of the, how, how data gets stored um, or, or across perhaps in, in HIE where uh, data is being uh, transferred from site to site, all of you know, so there's a common uh, common data set across all of them. Um, but I think the uh, yeah, the challenge is is, is, is a great question and, and one that I think is being uh, being explored right now in terms of the newness of all of this. Um, and, and from a transmission perspective, you know, obviously over the wireless networks and and phone lines, you know, 3G, 4G connections um, is typically how we're seeing access to uh, you know, CDS and other remote tools. Yeah, I can uh, speak a little bit just about APIs in general, which I, I really think that will be the common standard. And, and uh, you know, those use kind of a standard REST and OAuth models. Uh, but really, you're seeing the same thing for APIs used across all industries. So the same way you're, you're uh, grabbing data, for example, from Body Media or, or another device manufacturer, is actually the exact same way you're grabbing data from Facebook or Twitter or any of these providers as well. So that's really nice, at least for the developer community, is that you kind of have a common language of APIs uh, that you can use to connect up a variety of different industries, not just healthcare. All right. What about integrating telemedicine video? I'm not, I don't know if anybody has a lead on that question. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, it, it's common, and there are a number of uh, organizations now that are starting to uh, to do uh, remote health and telehealth. Um, it's a great concept because it, it provides access to a lot of folks to high quality healthcare that might might not otherwise be able to get to it. 
Um, so we're starting to see, I've got a, I work with one practice out in California that not only provides uh, telehealth and telemedicine consults to, uh, to uh, folks in California, but they also do it to orphanages in third world countries, so as a, as a kind of a charitable country. So that's a, it can have a huge impact. Um, has it made it down to the mobile world yet? Um, I think as uh, our networks get more robust and, and obviously the devices are, have gotten really strong, I think we'll start to see it on mobile devices as well. Would any of our other panelists like to weigh in on that one? All right. I, I'd like to address a question from one of our attendees. We will provide all registrants of the uh, Learning Lunch with a copy of the slides as well as a, down, a link to the video of this event. So don't worry about that. We'll take care of that uh, through an email after the event. Our next question is, are there any groups working on providing services to monitor and analyze these data streams and maybe even provide alerts to the patient and the practitioner? Hey, Brian, this is Kim. Um, I, I think, think there, there, there definitely, definitely are groups that are they're working towards that. And um, I, I think, think, you know, and maybe, maybe Steve can chime in, too, about how that data is shared. But it's up to each device company, manufacturer, to actually create these alerts that come to the patients. I know as our company, uh, since we are actually just a device manufacturer, and not medical professionals, we actually need to be very careful with the information and alerts that we do provide. For example, currently we do provide alerts that go to the patients or clients or customers, however you refer to them. We do provide alerts called um, custom feedback. So basically what I'm doing on a door, during, during that normal day the alerts will come through and say, hey, Kim, you're trending greatly toward what you're currently doing. If you continue to do this, you will reach your goal. Or it might say, you know, you ate a lot of sodium today, something like that. With our company, like I said, since we're just a manufacturer and we're not a medical professional, we do have to stick to the industry standard and provide feedback that resides in those guidelines. Maybe you could say more about that, Steve. Uh, well, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, as I said, the data is going to flow uh, via APIs and, uh, and hopefully finding kind of common standards and, and ways to process that. Um, you know, one of the big problems that we have to, to have to get through first is really the data silo issue. Each company kind of right now definitely still thinks that they own the data and they can control it and uh, limit access to it. Uh, and that's one of the big top conversations I see at kind of the big healthcare meetups and quantified self meetups as well is, is do you own your own data? Do you have the right to take that uh, to various places and other places? And how is that going to happen if we do? And we know there's, you know, the blue button with Obamacare and other things that's supposed to make data more free and more transparent. Uh, and so that's actually, you know, one of the next big jobs is, is one, making that happen. And two, really from a legal perspective and a, and a company perspective, figuring out who owns the data uh, and how much should be free out there. Don, would you like to chime in on this one at all? Yeah, I think you know, the, what we're starting to see are trends of, uh, of monitoring, you know, you know, for example, symptoms that are entered into a symptom checker um, and using that kind of data to, to, you, to push um, programs and or uh, reference content out to consumers. So again, if you're seeing a, a smoking symptom going in as a common thing, um, you can, the health system then or the physician practice can then have alerts being fired off or, or data being pushed back out to those consumers um, saying, you know, informing them of you know, programs that deal with smoking cessation or whatever it might be. So we're starting to see that kind of thing as well as taking those symptoms uh, entered on, you know, uh, mobile device, driving that back into the provider so when a patient shows up for a visit, they've actually got a, you know, a head start on, on that, uh, that care event. So there's some, uh, you know, doing some analysis of those symptoms prior to the patient showing up 
again, it allows for some efficiency and, uh, and some benefit all the way around. So one question we have from uh, uh, an attendee, and I'll, there's a second part to it that I'm going to come back to, but how do, so the question is, how do doctors access this data? We've heard a little bit about integration with EMRs, um, so that would be one way, but um, give us sort of a, a broader view of how doctors can use this information from patients. Brian, this is Kim. I will actually chime in for a portion of that. Um, I know with our product, we, you know, because some of the concern is, you know, the patient's actually getting ac the physician's access. Um, so I know with our product at Body Media, we actually have a, a system called ProConnect um, that allows physicians and patients to communicate together. Um, and part of that is, is that the doctor um, actually um, asks permission to view the data and uh, the user actually grants permission. Uh, to the physician, and not only to the physician, but you know any any participating provider in that organization uh, to view their data. So um, with our device, it's actually that they are they can view the data exactly the way a patient would their own data. Um, it is just that permission need be granted um, at the onset of that. So um, as far as um, taking it a step further, where we're actually integrating that data via an API. Um, maybe through an EMR or just through, through any other sort of platform. There's lots of medical professionals who have their own platform out there, um, and they, they are using our data via our API um, to have that dashboard of information flow through to them. I'm actually going to defer that question to Steve. Steve will be able to talk a little bit about how. Um, so there's, there's more of a, um, and Steve, if you could elaborate on this, but there's more of a, a one-time authorization that these patients are allowing um, all of their data to flow. Um, Steve, could you pick it up from there? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so basically, you know, if you're actually connecting to the API, uh, there's kind of a standard authentication model, which most of the industry uses for all their APIs, uh, and it's called OAuth, O-A-U-T-H. Uh, it's basically a way to authenticate a single user and then keep access open uh, to their account without actually having them have a login every time they want to send data. Uh, basically, the application that's, that's grabbing the data uh, keeps a record. Uh, we actually call them tokens. You can kind of think of it as a key. It's a key to their data that they can use over and over again to pull in uh, new data for the patients. Uh, so basically, what you see uh, is you go in once and you log into whatever system you're allowing them uh, to get access to your device data. Uh, very similar if you go onto a website and you uh, want to give them access to your Facebook feed. You know, you log in with your Facebook ID and password, and from that point forward, you know, that website will have access to your Facebook friends and, and your posts. Very, very similar to this here. Uh, once you give them access once, they can keep pulling your data over and over again. Uh, and, and the application can actually go ask every day if there's new data. We actually have a system where we'll actually go tell the application, hey, your patient has just dropped new data, so there's like a new night of sleep or, you know, there's a new few hours of activity. Uh, and so the application knows and automatically pick up the data that way. John, would you like to add to that? Um, so access to CDFs, uh, as an example, um, it can be done, uh, obviously, through uh, multiple different kinds of mobile devices. Uh, anytime, anywhere, and then fully integrated with EMRs for, and, and done in a broad range of, uh, of ways from simple integrations to HL, like HL7 info button integration um, so a, a provider can get access to uh, CDS you know, when they're actually doing documentation or reading a patient note um, to full API integration so um, CDS can actually be running in the background consuming information out of the patient note and providing real-time uh, feedback uh, and updates to uh, providers who are looking at it, uh, as well as through you know, patient portals or physician portals, um, et cetera. So the access is, is really uh, highly achievable in just about any environment. Well, I'm going to ask a question of my own now. Um, there's obviously um, some pretty significant HIPAA concerns around mobile devices, um, at least potentially. So I would like our uh, panelists to address, the, I guess, some of the HIPAA security issues around the, these devices. Maybe you'd like to start with that, Steve, or uh, anyone can chime in. Hmm. Well, I know specifically HIPAA is around uh, privacy concerns, but uh, as I mentioned, right now with our API, 
users actually giving them very explicit permission to access their data. Um, they're saying, you know, we allow you to access all of this uh, through the, the act of authentication. Uh, so from that perspective, they, they're actually at this point, to get access, they have to give uh, very explicit permission to that. Uh, um, and the other one that actually affects us a little bit is the uh, Childhood Protection Act on the Internet, uh, which limits us that well, we can't, uh, we know our devices work with children under 13, uh, but because of online privacy issues, we can't allow children under 13 to actually log into our services on the site. Uh, so that's another kind of concern. Is, but, is, uh, is this data typically actually, encrypted? What's that? Is this data stream typically encrypted from devices like this, or how does that work? Ah, well, yeah, because what we're actually sending is we're taking 5,000 different data points a minute against the body and sending that up to the back end. So it's a very raw hardware stream uh, divvied up across the different, a couple different channels. And it's only actually processed uh, on our servers once the data lands. And that's where we have a uh, machine learning, basically artificial intelligence systems that take that kind of raw data uh, and turn it into the actual useful information for the patient, such as the calorie burn, steps taken, how they're sleeping at night. Uh, so the actual raw information isn't really encrypted, but it's completely unusable uh, without actually reverse engineering that entire back end, at least for us. I see. Don, could you add to that? Sure. And, you know, many of the, the CDS tools that are uh, used um, don't really require patient uh, identifiable data. So, you know, for example, you know, you know, a diagnosis tool may just want age, gender, and the symptoms without having any other patient identifiable data to it, uh, as well as if you're thinking about a referential tool and you're looking up, uh, you know, what are the treatments for um, CHF, um, that doesn't require any patient uh, identifiable data. So the HIPAA requirement um, isn't as uh, uh, painful on the, on the CDS providers as, uh, as it might be uh, for an EMR or remote access via an EMR type of thing. I see. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, would you like to add anything, Kim? Yeah, Brian. Um, actually, the way that the uh, HIPAA is described, body media is not a covered entity. Um, and so, therefore, we do not um, engage in covered transaction as described under HIPAA. So, um, you know, that's and, – and the, you, the question you asked is a very common question. Um, but I think, you know, um, Steve answered um, – as well about the, the uh, child protection, which is something that we do take very seriously. And I think that, you know, body media is one of the only devices that is that in this category that is registered with the FDA. We are a class two medical device. So we do follow very um, stringent reg regulations. Um, but as it stands, we are not a covered entity um, as described under HIPAA. Well, and it, it makes sense too that if there's no identifiable data in the data stream, nothing that links it to the patient, then it wouldn't be protected health information anyway. Um, let's move on to another question. A couple of people have asked about um, the role of health information exchanges and how that relates to mobile data. Um, who would like to weigh in on that question? Well, uh, this is Don. Uh, you know, the, uh, the HIEs are really facilitating you know, cross-system and cross-practice data consumption and, and um, uh, you know, review. So I think they're doing a, a really phenomenal job of, of trying to take disparate data sets. And, and, uh, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of vendors have their own way of storing things. Taking all of those disparate things and trying to bring them into a standard, a uh, facilitated standard, so that when a, a patient shows up in uh, Office A and they've got information from Office B, Office say physicians and, and clinicians can see that information and use it uh, to make uh, the clinical uh, decisions uh, about the patient as they show up. So it gives, gives, gives providers a more complete picture of what's going on and, and gets us out of the siloed uh, healthcare that we're, that we're accustomed to. Steve or Kimberly, would you like to address that one as well? I do not have anything to add to that, Brian. Uh, same here. All right, let's ask another question then. Here's a particular question, and uh, we may have to return with a written answer for this one, but let's see if uh, any of our panelists can answer it. Are there any personal healthcare records apps available today that use blue button data? Uh, 
Uh, Fine, I'm not, I'm not familiar with what blue button data is. Don? Yeah, I'm familiar with uh, the personal health care record app, so you probably have to do a little research on that one. All right, well, we'll come back with a written answer to that question. Is there any work being done to allow practitioners to use mobile devices to more easily record progress notes? Uh, this is Don. There is uh, there are some some really neat things happening uh, with some innovative companies out there that are using mobile devices to uh, assist clinicians um, with the note taking process. Yeah, obviously, it's a you know, getting data into the computer. Um, you know, with some of the traditional point and click or dictation systems can be cumbersome. So there's some innovative companies that are actually starting to um, use um, you know, data uh, or voice, actually voice recording of the conversation between patient and provider and using, parsing through that data and using that to help then populate um, and drive the, the generation of a note and billing. So there's some really innovative things uh, being, being worked on right now um, that can help uh, efficiency and uh, uh, for providers uh, in their note taking. So just to follow up on that, um, I've certainly heard about voice recognition software being used uh, for the doctors dictating, but you're saying that there's software that on the horizon or at least uh, in development that would listen to the conversation between the doctor and the patient and then record and analyze that? Yeah, so it's in, uh, you know, actually there's, there's tools out there now that actually can parse through that, um, that voice data that was captured and then make sense of the terms and putting, you know, things like the current symptoms and family history into the right buckets um, and then use that data from the conversation to then drive, you know, the proper documentation. So it's, uh, there's some of those things being tested as we speak. Yeah, I'll echo down there. This is Steve. Uh, and I'm not sure on the established side, but I go to a lot of these uh, codathon and hackathons that are focused on the healthcare industry, and I and I agree that seems to be one active area of interest is improving that whole note-taking process. Uh, one of the interesting things I see that the hackers working on is also trying to do some of that stuff front end before you're actually sitting down with the doctor. Uh, so maybe there's a virtual doctor they jump online before their doctor visit and do half of the visit, the kind of standard questions that every doctor's going to ask right there online before they're actually in front of the doctor. So it speeds up the process for the doctor themselves. They've already gotten the kind of generic information ahead of time. They can just sit down and focus on exactly what the problem is. Uh, and, and, and many different ways, like that voice recognition, uh, kind of artificial intelligence, uh, learning on that. There's, there's a lot of focus on this at the time. Before you talked about how there's EHR integration, but then there's also integration with platforms. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by a platform in this context? Uh, sure. Well, platform is basically a, just kind of nice way of saying uh, it's, it's, it's the environment with which the devices live in. Uh, and so different people will have different platforms. You know, obviously, Body Media has their own platform that we're building. Uh, you know, uh, Cigna Care, uh, Aetna, CarePass, you know, all of these guys have their own kind of platform. Uh, and it really speaks to how the data is exchanged, what the data standard is, how it's captured. Um, now, there's, you know, pros and cons to doing it. You know, the, the good thing for providers, if there's a platform and you have patients or end users who are on it, uh, it kind of keeps them there because uh, all their data is there, all the devices are there. Uh, it becomes much more of a pain to move to another platform. Um, you know, uh, you have to basically transfer all your, your user information, you have to do all your logins, everything else. So once you're on a platform, you tend to stay there. Uh, this kind of just goes, you know, goes along with like the iPhone or Android model. Whichever one you pick, your life kind of kind of revolves around that platform pretty quickly, and you don't want to switch from iPhone to Android because it's so much data is involved. Same thing with healthcare platforms, basically. Uh, and, and so really that's the desire. Now, what I'd really like to see, and you know, what the industry really needs is a global platform. Uh, something that works uh, and isn't kind of siloed for individual companies, uh, but that works, you know, across the globe, across different, uh, you know, healthcare providers. That's what we'd love to get to, but that's really the jobs of the different standards commission. Uh, commission. Don, would you like to weigh in on that as well? And uh, I think from a, even a, a less broader perspective, um, there are tools that are being developed, you know, in today, you know, 
providers have uh, provider platforms or provider portals that bring together multiple kinds of uh, you know tools as well as data sets. So um, you know, there's you know, the, a lot of the EMR companies are, are building very specific provider um, portals that you know, provide access to kind of an aggregate of various uh, components. It's kind of a subset of, of what Steve was describing, but um, you know, there there are some uh, some nice activity around that. That you know, again, it's bringing bringing the tools they need to where they want it. So, you were talking before, Don, about um, kind of the universe of apps, which it makes a lot of sense that there would be sort of an app model for CBS. And then from Bada Media, we're hearing more about mobile devices. I guess this is kind of a vague question, but I guess where do you, do you see convergence with a sort of, you know, grand app slash device ecology? It sort of relates to the interoperability issue we're talking about as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. Um, there are, again, I think there's uh, there's people working on uh, how to integrate data from uh, mobile collection devices or, or you know things that uh, you know Body Media is doing, um, integrating that that data into um, potentially CDS things like symptom checkers. You may you, you may see things down the road, uh, you know, where we're taking you know, blood pressure and pulse and some of those types of things and having that feed in with uh, a couple of questions that might get asked of a patient prior to a visit um, to help facilitate uh, the efficiency during that visit. Um, so we're seeing, uh, I think there's going to be a, a huge convergence of that of the two uh, the two areas. And Steve, you were saying before that you, that API is sort of the key to interoperability for de mobile devices right now. Maybe you could expound on that a little bit. Um, in context of the previous question. Well, sure, yeah. Uh, you know, APIs are really kind of the, the data exchange, uh, like I said, the common language that they use uh, uh, to, to pass this information back and forth. Uh, and so however, whoever wants to obtain the information uh, basically needs to speak that language. Uh, and that's why it's good that, you know, at least in the API world, there's kind of a common standard, a common common mechanism for doing it. Now, not, of course, not everybody uses it. And, you know, I'm kind of simplifying things a little bit. Uh, you know, there, there's different uh, standards out there, uh, and there's definitely stuff that kind of still is in the old world. Uh, but it's, it's definitely moving forward to kind of a standard there. So that does make it nice for the mobile app developers uh, and really any other developers to kind of access that data uh, and, and drive that into mobile devices. And Brian, if I may um, add on to that, you know, that, that slide that, that Steve had um, with this whole, whole kind of ecosystem and this, this analytics engine, um, I mean, you're exactly right. There's going to be some convergence here, right, where all of these amazing devices, uh, technologies, applications come together. Um, you know, at, at Body Media, we see that, um, and we're, we're driving towards that. And so imagine that, you know, that, that box in the middle that, that Steve was talking about, this, this analytics engine where you're not only taking data from our device, Right, but so we're taking data from from all different devices, whether it be a heart rate monitor or, or glucose monitor. Um, you know, even that. You know, Steve had an image up there of the, a, a thermostat on the wall, that new Nest uh, device. You know, that that people are using in their homes. But taking all that data, you know, using the intellectual um, property that we have, and, and and using these algorithms, and then you know, have, so having the storage of all this information, but then having other partners come into the space with their intelligence and say, you know what, with this data, I want to create an app dedicated to sleep or dedicated to diabetes or dedicated to, um, you know, uh, elderly fall victims, you know, th those different things. So um, this, this kind of box, this black box of information is, is the sweet spot where we all can come together. So, we, you know, you have the devices feeding it in, in and then you have other partners coming, coming to the table and saying, now I can do something with that data. You know, you've provided us with this this data is accurate, and, and now we're going to take this data and, and bring it to the consumer in a meaningful way for specific markets. I'd like to ask a follow-up question to that. Uh, Kimberly, what do you, what device, if, if, <laughs> maybe this is kind of a trivial question, but what, if, if everyone had to wear one mobile device, what do you think that people should wear? What, what is the most important data to be gathered? That's a loaded question, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it really depends on, on what they are, what are their goals, what are they aiming for. Um, you know, 
what you're going to see hopefully more of, um, you know, and this is this, the space that Body Media resides in is a very protected space, and this is due to our patent structure. We have a very strong patent structure. But so a device that has is worn on body, so when we say on body, we, we need more than just wearing it in your pocket. We mean actually touching your skin, pulling your physiological data. Um, but also, so on body and then multiple sensors, right? So do you want to just what, measure one thing or do you want to measure a multitude of things? Um, and that's kind of, again, the sweet spot. So the example I just gave in the previous um, question about having this black box of information. I mean, so if you can wear one device that's going to give you many bits of information, Steve had mentioned um, body media actually collects 5,000 data points per minute off of your body. So, um, you know, with that, we can give you an array of information. So, I mean, anything that's going to drive someone towards their health and wellness goal, whatever it may be, um, it, it, it's going to have to be a personal choice. I mean, but again, you want to look for accuracy. You want to look for, for proven um, industry leaders um, and, and verifiable data. Don, you talked about um, part of the patient engagement aspect of it being that um, See, you could, it's CVS for consumers in the sense that symptom checkers can help if it's it's sort of a moderated um, expert level symptom checker, I guess is, is my crude way of putting it, that this can then keep patients from sort of wandering off into the woods of what they might find through Google and that sort of service. Um, t talk to that just a little bit more for us. Why is that important? Yeah, I think uh, it's important for a couple of reasons. I think there is uh, a plethora of information out on the web, um, and some of it's unvetted. So you might go into a wiki site about a particular disease, and you really have no um, assurance that the information that's on that wiki site is, has been vetted by healthcare professionals. Um, so providing consumers with a, a trusted tool or a source that's been uh, proven and or tested over over a period of time, um, actually lead to, lead them down you know a better path. I think that ultimately leads to is a, a better conversation between patient and provider. You know, providers don't have to spend you know an uh, inordinate amount of time um, talking about things that you know somebody found on a wiki that aren't going to be applicable to them at all. It's an exotic so tropical disease, and they live in Illinois or something. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think it's uh, providing them with a you know a focused, trusted source that has other vetted content behind it. Because it's not about just you know, gee, I I put in three symptoms and I may have uh, you know a, a brain tumor might be an example, but it allows the consumer then to you know read more information about the possibilities of a brain tumor, and they can become more informed about. You know, that particular thing and why they don't have that, but why they might just have you know, migraines or something like that. So it really you know, comes together, or pulls together not only the symptom checker bit, but also pulling in vetted content um, from, again, trusted partners. Well, I'm afraid we're nearly out of time. Uh, I want to remind our attendees that we're going to assemble all of the audience questions and post the answers on our site with links delivered via email later in the week. So look for those written answers to your questions if we didn't get to your question today. I would like to thank our panelists for joining us for today's learning lunch. I know that I learned a great deal about mobile technology, and it's, there's a lot of exciting things on the horizon. I would also like to thank all of our attendees today. Again, all registered attendees will receive an email with links to both recorded and PDF versions of this session. Be sure to join us at Format Approved for our next Learning Lunch, which will air April 30th. That Learning Lunch's topic is Understanding ICD-10 Integration and Tools. Keep an eye on your email box and our homepage for other upcoming topics. Thank you again to our attendees and our panelists for joining us today. I thought it was a great session. Great. Thanks.